Bill, our regular followers are no stranger to Dr. Bart Ehrman. Yeah, well, obviously, I'm a, I'm a scholar of the New Testament. And our regular followers are no stranger to Dr. William Lane Craig. If there is just one chance in a million that this is true, it's worth believing. That'll never get old. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Today we're joined by a friend of the channel, Dr. Bart Ehrman. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I've got something for you that's probably going to make you a little angry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, there's some enthusiasm. Well, it's your podcast. You do what you want. <laughs> and you do have that upcoming course. Paul and Jesus, The Great Divide. This is the topic of the course that I've just done, and that's the question. How similar are they? How different are they? And if we just had Jesus, if we didn't have Paul, would we have Christianity or not? Which my viewers can sign up for at tinyurl.com slash Divide. We'll talk more about that later, but feel free to make any topic connections as we go. I'll, I'll do that between bursts of anger. Thank you. That's well, correct. Uh, yes. <laughs> so you recently had a debate with Dr. Justin Bass regarding the resurrection on the Unbelievable Show. I'm sure you recall. Yeah. What say you? Was this the sort of thing that you would publish in a historical journal as an argument that Jesus was resurrected? Where was the expectation of a Messiah rising again from the dead? Tell me that. Because let me you finish. You haven't let me finish my point. No, no, no. Okay. Please let me no, finish no, my no, point. No, no, no. Jesus made this claim in the New okay, Testament. Let me finish. <laughs> I was you, doing I'm answering point. your question. You weren't answering you the question. Me my question. Okay. That's the exciting part when we arm wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> Justin's the right guy. I don't know what his relationship to logic and argument are sometimes. I think that he comes up with arguments that just don't make sense. And he, he just says things that I think are really meant to score points rather than be convincing to somebody who wants to see both sides of things. He's an energetic guy and he's a nice guy. But I would prefer having intellectual exchanges where somebody will pursue the logic of something rather than assert something. I was in awe of your patience during that. Well, he, he, I mean, I like to interrupt people too and such, but I mean, I think he goes overboard and he gets assertive. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, our mutual acquaintance, I guess we say, Dr. William Lane Craig decided to dedicate one of his recent podcast episodes to critiquing you and that debate. Huh. He started with his recollections of the resurrection debate you two had in 2006. What are yours? I didn't come away from either debate feeling very good about the event. In William Lane Craig's debate, it was partly because I thought he was trying to mock me during the debate, and I didn't like that. And I thought that really we could have an intellectual exchange without that. I also just thought that it's really, I think it's really bizarre that somebody's using Bayes' theorem to prove the resurrection. He did a PhD in the New Testament, and he tries to pass himself off as a New Testament scholar, but I, I don't really think he's a New Testament scholar. Well, let's see what Craig had to say. I prepared extensively for this debate because I was convinced that what Bart Ehrman was offering as his objection to belief in the resurrection of Jesus was nothing more than a warmed over version of David Hume's 18th century argument against miracles. I was shocked at his response, Kevin. It became evident that he wasn't even familiar with the work of David Hume, much less arguments against miracles, and that he thought I was offering a mathematical proof of the existence of God. You could tell that Bart Ehrman used to be a preacher because the remainder of the debate, it was basically preaching, yelling and lots of rhetoric and never came to grips with the argument. I remember that exchange. And yes, I have read David Hume. And I'll make a couple of points about that. One is, it's a little hard to say I'm a little warmed over thing of David Hume if I've never read David Hume. But another thing I'll say is that this kind of apologetic approach where it's guilt by association that, oh, you're like Hume. And that's the argument? Why is that an argument? Why is it an argument that you think you can trace my intellectual genealogy back to David Hume? And so, therefore, like you're wrong or something? This happened to me a number of times. It started happening to me still when I was an evangelical Christian. And I happened to be driving a well-known evangelical scholar to a conference as a guy I didn't much like, and I, he didn't like me. And we were having a discussion. And he finally just exploded at me and says, you're just following Hegel. You're a Hegelian. And I'm thinking, why is that an argument about anything? Like, I'm making a case for something, and you're dismissing because you're saying it's Hegelian. And so why would it, you know, if I'm saying, if my argument is, which is very similar to Hume's, that the problem with miracles is that they are so improbable 
that they are less probable than other explanations. So William Lane Craig thinks that that's just warmed over Hume. And by saying what's well, warmed over Hume, then he gets rid of it. But it's absolutely true. I mean, so why not deal with the argument instead of, you know, instead of making fun of me for not for thinking, I don't know, I've never read Hume. <laughs> well, back to your most recent debate. Dr. Craig started his critique with some harsh words for Dr. Bass, particularly for leaning on Paul rather than the Gospels. When it comes to his sources, when it comes to Paul's early letters, when it comes to traditions that he is quoting within the letters, uh, Paul, it's, it's agreed upon that he wrote those letters. It's agreed upon that. Yes, it's evident that Justin Bass has been strongly influenced, I think, by the apologetic methodology of Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona, the so-called minimal facts approach, which approaches this subject through the lens of the Apostle Paul. And I think that's a mistake. I think it's <laughs> tremendously short-sighted to ignore the abundant evidence of the Gospels, where there also exists a large majority opinion in support of the fundamental facts underlying Jesus' resurrection. Wait a second. That's what their minimal facts are. <laughs> Abermas is all about the minimal facts about the resurrection. Well, uh, maybe I misheard him just now. But <laughs> So once again, you have guilt by association. Oh, yeah, that's just regurgitation of Habermas. Why do they even do that? But I think it's a mistake, too. I mean, I did think that Justin made a mistake to rely on Paul. I think that he would have a better argument if he went to the Gospels, but it's a better argument in the kind of the way, like, I'll have a better chance against Michael Jordan if I play with two hands instead of one. <laughs> it isn't like, it isn't like you've got a problem, now you've solved the problem. <laughs> and so I, I mean, what are you like, Craig? I'm sorry. If you go to the Gospels, that was originally the problem, is that you've got gospel accounts of the resurrection of Jesus that are completely at odds with each other, they contain contradictions and claim, contain improbabilities, and they don't solve the problem that no matter what you say about your evidence for the resurrection based on sources written 30, 40, 50, 60 years later, based on this evidence from decades later, you still have an account of somebody rising from the dead that is the one time this has ever happened in the history of the universe and saying that it's far more probable than somebody came up with a story about it. Okay, but oh yeah, well you can't use that argument. That's, that's warmed over Hume. No, that's wrong. This is how we do history. We decide what most probably happened in the past. And if you tell me that because somebody living 50, 60 years later said Jesus got raised from the dead, that's better evidence that he got raised from the dead than some other evidence, even though the resurrection from the dead happened once in the history of the universe, that's more probable than something that happens millions of times every day. Okay, well, I can't help you with your logic. Sorry. <laughs> even if no, That's great. <laughs> and those are namely these. Uh, Jesus' crucifixion. Then we have the the claim, the actual just claim of Jesus' resurrection. Um, the third is the appearances. Uh, and then the fourth would be, uh, I, I could use uh, the great title from Bart's book, The Triumph of Christianity. Yes, he's assembling the facts that need to be explained. But you notice he left out two of the most important, namely the burial of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea, which shows us that they knew the location of the corpse in Jerusalem. It was public knowledge. And then secondly, again, the very public fact of the discovery that Jesus' tomb was empty. Why anyone would ignore those two facts that are staring us in the face in making a case for Jesus' resurrection is beyond me. And uh, the wide majority of New Testament scholars acknowledges those facts. So, well, no, the wide majority, if you, if you include fundamentalist scholars, if you include fundamentalists, you consider to have evangelical well, it's true the majority of scholars agree with those facts. I wouldn't call them facts. Where do you even start? If you think that these records of Joseph of Arimathea burying Jesus, the first time it's mentioned is 40 years after the fact by an author who not only was not there, he is living in a different part of the world. He's speaking a different language. He doesn't know any eyewitnesses. He doesn't say anything about any eyewitnesses. He doesn't name any eyewitnesses. He's simply giving you a story that he's heard about something that happened 40 years earlier, that that is the basis for a fact. Is this how historians do their work? I mean, obviously, look, none of these apologists is a historian. I don't think any of them has read any historiography. I don't think that they know. Maybe William Lane Craig has. I don't know. I mean, but he certainly doesn't work like any other historian works. You cannot use the kind of criteria that he uses for the historical Jesus to do ancient history or to do medieval history or any other kind of history. Look, you have stories about Apollonius of Tiana going to heaven and being seen going to heaven and coming back, an eyewitness account. You have an eyewitness, firsthand account of Romulus going to heaven. So 
And look, somebody said so. Okay. Is that your kind of evidence? So yes, Justin would have made a better argument if he had dealt with the empty tomb. It's a mistake not to use that argument. <laughs> it's still hugely problematic. And how can you ignore the problems? The rest of the critique is focused on you. The most probable thing is the violation of a law of physics that has never been violated for in 13.8 billion years. Never. Except in this one instance. Well, now, if you're a historian, historians don't argue that something that happened only once in all of history is the most probable occurrence because somebody said it happened. Yeah, this is so bad, Kevin. It shows that Bart Ehrman hasn't learned a thing in over 20 years. He is still offering that same warmed over version of Hume's argument against the identifiability of a miracle. <laughs> I don't know what he thinks historians do for a living, but it's clear he's never like hung out with any of them. I mean, how do you decide if you have a miracle attributed to Baal Shem To, the best, for whom we have records of his miracles written by a person who was the son of the best's personal assistant. So within a few decades, by somebody who knew an eyewitness and has, has several sources of information about the best's miracles, extremely well attested. Does William Lane Craig apply his criteria to that or not? Or does he say it's unlikely because of X, Y, and Z? Because, and so well, he says it's unlikely because of X, Y, and Z. And the rationale he uses would be what he's calling overwarmed humes. Exactly. And while as a New Testament scholar, he might have an excuse for not being familiar with these sorts of philosophical arguments. Ehrman has no excuse in this case because these things have been explained to him and he is ignoring them and he is evincing a kind of invincible ignorance with regard to these issues. His claim that historians appeal to some sort of a frequency model of probability where they could never establish a singular event is just completely wrong. No, 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 no. Stop there. Stop there. Wrong. That's not what I'm arguing. And if he thinks that's what I'm arguing, he needs to get some ears in his head. Of course, singular incidents can be attested. Most of history is a singular event. The question is, if you've got reports of something, how do you evaluate its probability? Historians can only establish probability. That's all historians could do. And so if you have an event such as Romulus ascending to heaven, which after Romulus allegedly ascended to heaven, there was a senator who came forward and said that Romulus had come down to him and talked to him and told him and explained it to him, and he saw Romulus afterwards. Okay, so that's, that's a historical report. So if you get that as the historical report, you have to ask, did it happen or not? Now, you don't say, well, it couldn't happen because nobody's ever done that. That isn't what you don't say. It couldn't have happened because of that. You say, okay, what are our options for explaining why somebody told that story? So somebody will say, well, it's somebody who wanted the Roman people to think that Romulus had become a divine being, which they did, uh, as, as the god Quirinus. Or you could say that it was a senator who wanted to hide up the fact that the senators actually had killed Romulus and hidden his body. Or you could say, you know, you, you come up with your list of explanations. Okay, these are the possible explanations. Now, which one is more probable? Is it more probable that he ascended to heaven and became the god Quirinus? Or is it more probable that the senators who hated him killed him? Which is more probable? It's not that it's a unique fact. I mean, it's going to be unique either way. The question is, which is more probable? And this is where his warmed over Hume comes in, which it comes in for him as well, because he uses it with Romulus. It's more likely that people who do this kind of thing all the time did this kind of thing in this case, than that he did something that's like so spectacular, it's like it's never happened before or since. That makes it more likely. So it's not the singularity. And, you know, he's just so, he is very hard-headed. I don't think he's hard-headed. I think he just has to defend himself. But so anyway, sorry. In one sense, every event in history is unique. And of course you can establish. He's going to say when I just say it. But of course it's unique. Yes. <laughs> Events that have a frequency of one time in history. It all depends on whether the evidence is good enough for it. And here he fails to reckon with the fact that one must not only consider the intrinsic probability of the event. But what he doesn't consider is that other factor in the probability calculus, namely, what is the probability of the evidence given the resurrection of Jesus compared to the probability of the evidence given no resurrection of okay, Jesus? You could stop right there. You could stop right there because that's plain false. That's precisely what I'm doing. 
there are some explanations that are far more probable than a miracle at this point. And so that is precisely what I'm doing. And if he doesn't see that, then I can't help him. So Ehrman here is completely confused. No one should be deceived by this sort of philosophical drivel. Okay, stop there. He, he's a philosopher, and maybe he sits around philosophizing about how you do history. But if he would read some historians who do things like try to figure out you know, what happened in the year 1000, he would realize that, in fact, this is not because of what he's seeing as based on some kind of 18th century human English deist. It's how historians work. You have criteria for establishing probabilities. And they're not, by the way, they're not Bayes theorem. But okay. Yeah. This is not an objection that is based upon historical research or upon New Testament studies. This is a philosophical objection. It's Hume's argument against the identification of a miracle. And here, Bart Ehrman is completely outside of his field. This is not New Testament studies. It's not history. It is philosophy. And his faux pas are evident in the way he handles this question. I'm sorry if I appear overly passionate about this. Kevin. But honestly, it just aggravates me that Ehrman, 20 years after our debate and his writing about these things, should be spouting the same philosophical mistakes when he's been corrected on these. He has no excuse for this. You know how when you buy like a certain car, like you buy a Volkswagen, and all of a sudden you start saying, yeah, sure, all of Volkswagen's on the road, you know, or you, you buy a BMW, you know, you get a nice car. Oh, God, yeah, he has one. Too. Well, lots of people have BMW. Wayne yeah. Lane Craig is like, he's a philosopher. So it's like he says, oh, hey, wait, that's a philosopher. <laughs> that's a, Oh, wait, he's doing philosophy. Right. So I would suggest that he reads historians. And I don't know if he's any good as a philosopher. I have no way of knowing. I mean, you know, maybe he is. I really don't know. But I don't know any historical work he's ever done. I, maybe you could tell me. I don't know. Has he actually done any history? Well, he's been doing his recent Adam and Eve research. Um... <laughs> no, 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 no. I want my history. <laughs> no, I'll, you know. No, no, so, like, I'm sorry. I mean, if you, I, mo most of my work is in the field of history. I mean, I, I work in second and third, fourth century Christianity. I have had historians write me, professional historians, me about how I go about establishing what Jesus said and did the kind of historical methodology. And they say, oh my God, I never had that explained to me in graduate school. And you know, I'm not making this stuff up. This is how historians of Jesus do it. It's not how people who are fundamentalists do it. Because fundamentalists just, they read the Bible and they whatever's in there has to be true. So you figure out a way to argue for it. William Lane Craig is coming up with for arguing for things that he already thinks, rather than looking at historical evidence in order to decide whether something happened or not. So if you're convinced Jesus was raised from the dead, then obviously he was raised from the dead. And if so, then you can make arguments for it. And if somebody argues against it, well, they've got a bad argument. If you're a philosopher, then you say, well, it's because it's warmed over here. <laughs> <laughs> I think the big issue in, in uh, Christian apologetics is that apologists are doing theology, claiming to do history. The hypocrisy of Urban's statement is that there's a difference between doing history and doing philosophy. And yet his conclusions are determined by his naive philosophical arguments and not by historical evidence. When we apply the canons of historiography to the sources for the life of Jesus, those facts that I mentioned fall out of such an investigation. That is how far the historical historical investigation goes. The next step then will be a philosophical argument as to what is the best explanation of those. And there one will consider the various criteria for assessing something as the best explanation and argue that the resurrection hypothesis exceeds its rivals in terms of explanatory power, explanatory scope, degree of ad hocness, plausibility, and so on and so forth. And so the approach of the Christian apologist is, is on all fours with the approach of the historian. Yeah, well, what can I say? I mean, he talked about canons of historical research. I'd love to know what his canons of historical research are. And I'll work with, right. I'd love to know, I'd love to see how he takes those same canons and applies them to other miracle workers from the ancient world or other people who ascended to heaven in the ancient world or in other religious traditions. What if you apply these canons to Muhammad ascending to heaven? So it's an interesting question. I can tell you, how do I put this? Those who use that kind of argument almost never have yet applied them 
to other figures that are comparable. And when they decide to apply them, they decide that those comparable figures, they're not historical. And it always works out that the person they believed in since they were a child or since they had their born again experience, that person passes these canons and the others don't. But in fact, if you don't care one way or the other and you just apply the canons, it never works out that way. I doubt if William Lane Craig has convinced very, maybe he has, maybe he's convinced a lot of secular historians that Jesus was really raised from the dead. I'd love to know whether he's convinced anybody. I know a lot of secular historians who decided, yeah, actually, I'm having trouble being a Christian now. Because I really, you know, when you actually put it that way, it's kind of hard to see how that could be historic. I'm telling you, it happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why is that? Is it because of people like warmed over Hugh? Is it because of the devil? Is it because what? What is it? I don't know. <laughs> right. Well, it's you. You're leading them astray. Personally. No, I don't know what to do with them. I find that what to do with it. I just like I. Yeah, I'm just. I'm doing what historians do. It's not like a big thing. It's what historians do. Mm. <laughs> Bill, do you think Bart thinks that having the domain of the historical method in his corner, rather than theology or philosophy, that he has a perceived intellectual advantage? I think you're correct that Bart Ehrman thinks that, when in fact, it's not the case. I mean, the dirty little secret here is that Bart Ehrman is not a New Testament historian. He is a text critic. His area of expertise is establishing the original text, the original Greek text of the New Testament documents. That's what he was trained in. That's what he has his doctrine in. That's his area of expertise. And he's only lately come over then to try to do historical Jesus research. And when he does that, as we've just seen, it is driven by this naturalistic philosophy that precludes a priori miracles based upon this obsolete and demonstrably incorrect argument of David Hume. So that's wrong on almost every score. I'll go with the last thing to begin with. I do not a priori leave out miracles. It's wrong. I do not say philosophically that miracles can't happen when I'm doing my argumentation. In fact, I'm always very clear about it. He obviously hasn't read any of my work on this because I've said there's a difference between a philosophical argument against miracles and a historical argument against miracles. And I deal with the historical arguments. I do not make a priori objections the way he claims. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, this really ticks me off that people say that I was trained as a textual critic and not as a historian. That just shows his ignorance about me. He has no idea. Do you know how many PhD courses I took in textual criticism when I do my PhD? Zero. How many? Zero. Zero. You might know how many I had in my master's work on textual criticism, establishing the text of the New Testament? I had one half of one course. Mm. My courses were all on New Testament interpretation and the history of early Christianity when it comes to New Testament studies. I was trained to be an interpreter and a historian of early Christianity. So I went into textual criticism. There were no courses on it anywhere in the country except for in fundamentalist circles. So I went to Princeton Seminary to study with Bruce Metzger so I could have somebody to guide my work. I wasn't trained in it at all except for conversations with Metzger. When I was trained in, I had far more courses in and the historical Jesus stuff was like, this was our bread and butter in my PhD program, both my master's and my PhD program. That's what we did. We did gospel analysis and we did uh, historical analysis of historical Jesus. And so he's just wrong about that. And so to say that I'm trained as a textual critic and so I know nothing about history, I'm sorry. And to say that I'm using philosophical a priori is just flat out wrong. And if he would read my stuff, look, he can't read my stuff. I mean, he won't read my stuff and believe what I'm saying because he says, no, he doesn't really mean that. He really means that he's doing English deism. And, you know, it's just so crazy. And again, I just love to see his can- historical canons and see how he applies them to others. Besides the person that he, that he and two billion other people worship, if you, you know, how do you apply this to other things that have equal or better evidence? Do you seriously apply these canons or not? All right. Well, I'm sorry to have riled you up on that, oh, but, uh, but I appreciate the response. <laughs> <laughs> well, does anything that we talked about here, because we did talk a little bit about the differences between Paul and Jesus, and does any of this apply at all <laughs> to the course that we're hoping that people will take? Uh, well, indirectly. I mean, the course is on the relationship of Paul and Jesus. And one of the big issues in the course is, you know, does Jesus himself preach the same message that Paul preaches? And the reason that relates to what we've been talking about is because Paul's message 
is all about the death and resurrection of Jesus. So this is an eight lecture course where we talk about what we know about Jesus teachings, how we know them, what the problems are. Uh, for William Lane Craig, it'd be no problems. You just read the Bible and it tells you. But you know, historian, there are, there are problems. And so if there are problems, do we know what Jesus really preached and what was it? What was his message? And historians since the 19th century have argued that Jesus thought that, believed that the kingdom of God was coming and people need to repent in preparation for it. Paul, on the other hand, we look at what Paul said and difficulties in knowing that. And what does Paul say? Paul says that the way to, to enter the kingdom of heaven is by believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so it's a question, is that the same thing or not? Is Jesus preaching that you need to repent and follow God's law to enter the kingdom the same as saying you have to believe in Jesus' death and resurrection? And Paul's belief is completely based on the death and resurrection of Jesus. Not on Jesus' teachings. He, he only quotes three of Jesus' sayings. <laughs> and they, are, they are particularly central ones to Jesus' teachings. But that's why, I would say that's why someone like Justin Bass, I don't know for sure because I didn't ask him this, but I'd imagine that's why he wants to stick with Paul. First, because Paul's the earliest source. Justin realizes that the Gospels are decades later and are problematic as historical sources. So he sticks with Paul because we have his own writings. And also because Paul is a key figure for the resurrection because he cites witnesses to seeing Jesus afterwards and says he himself was a witness. And so that's the apologetic power of going that route, even though I think I agree that it's probably a mistake. So the questions are that in my course, the questions I deal with, you know, how do we know what Jesus really said and did? Did he predict his death and resurrection? And if he did, did he say that you've got to believe in those things? Or did he have a different message? If he had a different message, is it different from Paul's? Is it like kind of like Paul's? Is it completely contradictory to Paul's? Is there some kind of continuity if you draw between Jesus and Paul? Those are the kinds of issues that I think you have to wrestle with. If you don't take history seriously, there's no issue. So William Lane Craig doesn't need to watch my course because he doesn't see the issue. Jesus preached the same thing Paul preached. Paul preached the same thing and Jesus preached. Fine, okay. It's like, I mean, it might be a little different. Well, you got Easter in between there, so he changes it. But basically, it's all the same. Historians don't treat their sources that way. And William Lane Craig apparently doesn't know how to treat historical sources because he just treats them as telling you the truth. I often put forth a naturalistic hypothesis that Really, only Peter and Paul were necessary to have had visions to explain mm -hmm. pretty much all the data yeah. that we've got. Uh, I get a lot of pushback from skeptics on that and said, well, is Peter even really necessary? And my um, response to that is generally that, well, no, obviously Christianity predated Paul because Paul yeah. confesses himself that he was persecuting yeah. Christians. Yeah. Yeah. And the pushback I get from that is like, do we have sufficient evidence that Paul was actually persecuting Christians to say that. I think we have good evidence for it. I don't think that Paul, I mean, it depends how you read Paul. You know, if you think that Paul is just a hypocrite and a liar and just, you know, making stuff up, then there's no argument against that. So, you know, you'd have to say that Paul was just lying about it. My view is, you know, I'm not I'm not opposed to that in principle. I don't have an a priori against that idea that he's lying yeah. about it. I think you have to look at it. And I think Paul was not proud of his past and I think we have independent attestation that Paul was a persecutor. He himself says that he was a persecutor, and he seems to be ashamed of it. The book of Acts has records of things that don't appear to come from Paul, because the, oddly, Luke, who's his hero is Paul, <laughs> right. know a lot about Paul. he like, gets a lot of things wrong about Paul, but also persecuting is a major major feature there. You get the Deuteropauline letters that talk about Paul's persecution. You get later legends about Paul's persecution. So I think probably Paul did persecute people. I don't think that Paul invented the idea of Jesus' death and resurrection. I think he certainly, certainly got this from followers of Jesus before him. I assume that Peter had some kind of vision. I think that that's plausible. I think it's plausible that Mary Magdalene did as well, because we have these sources that have her be the first. And some of these are independent of each other. And so I think it's hard to explain that unless she was proclaiming the resurrection fairly early on as well. So, you know, as it turns out, that's Peter, Paul, and Mary. <laughs> so I think, that's, I think that's our basis. I don't think that we have good evidence that Jesus appeared to the 12. Paul says they did. Right. Okay. Well, you opened up a new Pandora's box, and I'm going to leave that for another day. If you'd like to sign up for what sounds to be an incredibly illuminating course from Dr. Ehrman, Paul and Jesus, The Great Divide, go to tinyurl.com slash barkdivide or tap on the link in the description. And by doing so, you'll be helping this channel, which I greatly appreciate. Thank you so much for hanging out with me again, and uh, I hope your blood pressure returns to normal. Uh, for well, the rest you know, of your day. it might, but uh, you know, nothing to get me going like Justin Bass and William Lane Craig. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I appreciate you stepping into the torture chamber voluntarily. Appreciate <laughs> okay. <you. laughs> That's great. Thanks. 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 For more Apology of Bart Ehrman team-ups, tap on the thumbnail on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Well, y'all, in 30 minutes, you'll never get back in your life. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, God. Later. <laughs>